since the beginning of the 20th century, scientists have proposed a link between the size of insects and the concentration of oxygen. But it wasn't until 2007 that an experiment finally proved it. In the Chicago suburbs, the Argonne National Laboratory houses the United States' most powerful synchrotron, a scanner that generates the brightest X-ray beams in the Northern Hemisphere. The distance around the particle accelerator is more than half a mile. So Jake Soka, the scientist in charge of the study, uses a trike to get around. Today, live insects are being put under the scanner. We use the idea that you can take living insects and make inferences about insects that existed in the past. What we're trying to do in this study is to test an old hypothesis that the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere is what limits insect body size. So the idea with this hypothesis is that when you have more oxygen, your insects can get larger, and when you have less oxygen, insects will get smaller in response. Uh, but no one had really ever tested this hypothesis before. So we use synchrotron x-rays to look inside the animal to study the dimensions of their tracheal system. This particle accelerator generates extremely intense and focused x-rays that pass through the insect's body. Our purpose is to see the tracheal system in action. And some of the tracheal tubes are really small. Uh, and we want to see it in the living animal. Um, so this is really the only technique where we, we can do all of those things. For the first time, scientists are able to actually observe an insect breathing. Would you turn the beam on? Using this experiment, they discovered Ready? that crickets not only breathe passively, but also use their whole bodies to carry air to their organs. And you can see that bubble in the gut moves forward to the head, and it moves backward. And every time it's doing that, it's synchronized with the compression of the tracheal system. The movements that you see here are, are not a passive effect. This is an active movement um, by the animal, and it's the ultimate cause of it are contraction of muscles. Just as this cricket contracts its digestive system to send air to its organs, Meganeura would have contracted its abdomen to absorb the thick carboniferous air. The elastic exoskeleton would resume its shape once the muscles had completed their action. But beyond the discovery of this internal movement, what interests Jake Soka is the space occupied by the respiratory system within the insect's bodies. He has compared beetles of different sizes to study the link between their size and that of their respiratory system. And what we found is that the tracheal tubes take up a larger fraction of the body as you go from smaller to large than you might expect. So what we think, based on the study, is that if you would make this even larger, so if we would scale this up farther and farther, eventually you reach a limit where you can't stuff more tracheal system inside the animal because you have to have other things like muscles and gut and nervous tissue. Um, fat bodies, things like that, that are all important for the physiology of the animal. You can't just have one big tracheal system. The higher oxygen concentration of the Carboniferous period meant that insects required fewer respiratory tubes and could therefore grow to a larger size. But with the modification of the atmosphere, the giant insects had to reduce their size over millions of years of evolution. And not all of them survived these changes. 290 million years ago, during the Permian period, oxygen levels decreased from 35% to 23%, close to today's level. Pangaea had already formed a supercontinent extending from one pole to the other. Surrounded by a single ocean, 
it was subject to extreme climatic conditions. The heart of the continent suffered drastic temperature changes and deserts appeared. But at the equator, heavy rainfall allowed the great forest from the Carboniferous era to survive. During this period of major climate change, punctuated by the monsoons and the warming of the atmosphere, a living fungus appeared on the bark of trees. This tiny mushroom uses an enzyme to break down wood. Gradually, plant debris and dead trees decompose and no longer build up on the ground to form coal. The fungus stopped the accumulation of carbon on the ground, and instead it was recycled into the atmosphere. The proportion of oxygen in the air decreased gradually, with major consequences for the environment. This transitional period brought about the demise of Arthropleura, a distant relative of the centipedes. But why did the first giants of the Carboniferous period disappear? Could their lifestyle be responsible? In 1977, Arthropleura fossils were found in Autun, in the heart of the French countryside. The slag heaps surrounding this former mining town are hallmarks of its industrial past. In the local Natural History Museum, tribute is paid to the miners who discovered fossils while they were working. Among them, this impressive set of footprints, the most important ever found in France. They're examined by Sylvain Charbonnier, a specialist in arthropods, the family of invertebrates that includes insects and centipedes. Here you can see a set of tracks. You have two trails that are parallel. This was made by an organism of quite a respectable size, an animal that must have measured around three feet long. It's just a fragment of the track that was probably much bigger. Unfortunately, no adult-sized fossil has been discovered. But the paleontologists have found many smaller specimens in these coal deposits. You can see here what this little creature looked like. These are juvenile specimens, which are tiny. Here's a complete specimen with its shell that is well preserved. So obviously this organism, as it grows, will produce larger trails when it moves. Arthropleura was rather similar to modern centipedes. It could reach 10 feet in length and it crawled on the ground or up trees in search of food. Life in the rainforest during the early Permian period was quite similar to that of the Carboniferous period. And there was enough oxygen in the atmosphere for Arthropleura to thrive and face unexpected predators, such as Eriops. This amphibian locates Arthropleura using cells in its skin that detect vibrations on the tree trunk. But Arthropleura had a considerable advantage. The claws at the ends of its articulated legs allow it to grip the trunk, and its protective shell shields it against attackers. Arthropleura's disappearance may not have been caused by predators, but by decreasing food supplies. This creature was a herbivore. At the time, it would have had plenty to eat. At that time, the vegetation was equatorial or tropical, so it was an extremely lush vegetation with a great variety of plants. These plants are in fact the origin of coal. Arthropleura lived in this forest environment. You also have on the other side trees and leaves that were found in Arthropleura's stomach contents. So it probably fed on these tree branches. Did they eat from trees lying on the ground or did they climb trees? These are hypotheses we will probably never know for sure. 
These fossilized plants have been so well preserved that they still appear alive. But as they began to disappear, Arthropleura had to adapt. This forest environment will tend to dry out at the end of the Carboniferous. The climate will change, the vegetation will disappear, and Arthropleura will lose its food source, which is probably one reason that explains its extinction.